Uh, uh, hello, um, uh, uh, this is uh, Ron Field um, over here in England, and uh, I'm uh, about to start my live um, show for Civil War Faces um, and uh, Civil War Faces, um, the Photographic Collector Society. Um, I'm just checking out, see if there's anybody there yet. Hi, Jerry, thank you. I've got one. Hola. <laughs> I'm just going to hang on in here now until um, some others have joined us. I, I, I have to say, having got ready for this um, show myself, I realise just how much work other collectors have put into this. It, it, it's... Uh, it's um, it's uh, um, good to see it all coming together, uh, but it, it, well, I've never done anything like this before, so uh, hi, Ron, thank you. And Jeff, hello. Mississippi, I believe. Um, okay, yeah, I, um, I'm going to wait a little bit longer. Al, thank you. <laughs> good, to, good to see you. How's the collecting going? I've got two screens here, so I'm probably going to keep looking at the wrong one at the top there. Okay. Just wait for a few more people to join. Now I know what uh, Ron Coddington does when he's sitting here waiting for Gilbert. Hi. Hello from Georgia. Bill. Bill Schultz. Thank you. This is great. This, this works, isn't it? It's amazing. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll start um, uh, the preamble then, now then. Um, and thanks for joining me uh, this afternoon, this evening. Um, uh, and thanks to the Civil War Photographic Collector Society, directed by Doug York uh, and uh, Ron Coddington. The presentation is on behalf of the show Caretakers, sponsored by the Civil War Photographic Collector Society, directed by Doug York and Ron Coddington. And this is Ron Field here this evening uh, to take you through some of my uh, collection. Uh, um, and um, I guess I, I ought to, I mean, it's very helpful that um, Ron and Doug have provided me with, with some questions. I'll try and dip into those as I, as I go. Um, a bit about my background, I'm a collector and an historian. I was an historian before I was a collector, actually, out of necessity. Um, I was a, a, a teacher, history teacher, for um, 34 years. I taught in the States, in California, for a, a while. Um, I was associate editor for the Confederate, Confederate Historical Society of Great Britain, and uh, I ran a... Um, a uh, uniform and a flag series for that, that journal. Um, I was uh, elected a fellow of the company of military historians in 2005. And I've written numerous articles and produced various artworks for that society over the years. I have occasionally had articles uh, and images published in military images um, over the years, and uh, Ron Coddington has kindly billed me as um, a senior editor for MI since 2007, which I, I, I feel is a great privilege. So thank you, Ron. Um, I also produce material for um, uh, the Civil War Navy magazine on a regular basis and work closely with editor Gary McQuarrie. I, um, I, just, uh, I just got my copy um, yesterday with um, the uh, the last um, 4th of July parade um, article in it, which I, I'm very pleased with. And um, for Civil War Navy magazine, I uh, produced the uh, the Navy Apprentice uh, uh, um, article, which was um, also chosen for the, uh, the front cover for that too. So I, I, I get around basically with um, as much as I can, and I appreciate what other people are prepared to publish that I, I produce. Um, let's start with the first question that, that uh, Ron and Doug provided. Um, 
I first became interested in the Civil War in um, the centenary, actually, in uh, 1961, and just saw a small piece in a um, newspaper with a photograph of uh, a group of uh, reenactors or living historians, as uh, we prefer to call them today. And uh, I was struck by struck by this and uh, I began to buy books, find books in London. Uh, which were quite rare back then, had to look a long way. Um, the American Heritage Book of the Civil War, I think, was my first treasure to uh, acquire for my, uh, to build a library. Um, and so uh, the, the years uh, go by and I, I'm not really um, involved in uh, Civil War research and uh, writing. Um, uh, until really um, 1983, 1983, 1984, when I start writing for the uh, the various um, uh, societies uh, over here and it, it, over there. Um, and so um, my collecting side of things didn't actually uh, kick off um, for a long time. I was most envious of collectors and the images they collected fascinated me whenever I got the opportunity to see them, mainly in museums. Um, but I, just per chance, uh, one of my students, one of my uh, senior students um, who I, I, I was teaching um, the causes of the American Civil War and the, uh, and the American Civil War at, at uh, junior and senior high level, um, the equivalent over here and one of the students uh, came to me and said oh, I have a small collection uh, that my mother would like to um, sell if it's of any use to you and what you do and I was quite keen to see and uh, this was my first image purchase um, well it wasn't one image in actual fact it was a bunch of them um, get the hang of this now <laughs> Robert E. Lee, and that was, I believe, based on the life of, wasn't it, that one, um, that, and that was produced by the revolving uh, studio, uh, Bayswater in London, the back mark, and um, Beauregard, Beauregard, with uh, grey hair, so the uh, the dye had stopped coming through the blockade by then. Um, Stonewall Jackson, produced by uh, Anthony from, a, from a, a, a Brady, but obviously the, the uniform, was it like a photo montage thing going on there? Napoleon II, by Disderai in Paris, over there in Paris. And this guy was Alexandra Walewski. That's Napoleon the First's illegitimate son. This one I like. This is the litho of, of, um, after Brady's image of um, Jefferson Davis. But got written on the back Lincoln okay and lastly and this is the curious oddity about it all which left me to look further that's the ruined courthouse at Dyersburg in Tennessee and that's what it says on the back too so it's verified in in, in, in pen, which pretty much looks like pure pencil so that those are the first images, first bunch of images, but what came along with them as well was some cheap music from the period. Bonnie Blue Flag, uh, an original edition uh, of one of the, the probably the original edition of it. Um, Kingdom Coming. And uh, the, the, the faded. The, the, the faded grey jacket, which was post-war, 66-67 publication. But the fascinating thing about these was they were signed. 
and um, we can make that out or not, but this was signed William Henry Galliat, and it's got written underneath CSA. Um, and I began to wonder about this guy. Um, I didn't really have much time to do any research about him um, until I retired, basically, because I put these to one side and got on with the, the rest of what I had to do on a daily basis. But when, when I put some serious research into um, the Galliant, William Henry Galliant, his nickname was Harry, or his short name was Harry, he was quite an important guy. The Galliant family were, in actual fact, major suppliers to the Confederacy from Liverpool. Um, this is Will, the, the guy that owned these, this sheet music, and I assume the images, uh, uh, um, was the son of William Henry Galliat Sr., who, who was a, a major buyer of uh, Virginia tobacco. And when the Civil War kicked off, um, uh, a, a guy called J, um, uh, a tobacco factor in, uh, in Richmond, uh, um, James Thomas Jr., uh, rushed to sell as much of uh, his tobacco as he could um, over the Atlantic, and it, it went to the Galliat Company, J.K. Galliat, actually, which was the, the uncle. But, uh, um, Harry Galliat was a, the guy who ran the Liverpool concern of the business. And so he uh, uh, um, bought uh, Virginia tobacco and then began to finance the Confederacy to quite a huge extent. Uh, um, a quote here, or, or, uh, Confederate purchasing agent Colin J. McRae arranged with Galliat and Company to purchase or build steamers to run the blockade. And uh, and uh, these were built secretly, obviously. Uh, and there's six of them, six steamers, which were being built to run the blockade. Unfortunately, on this count, none of them were finished in time to be used during the Civil War. Uh, but the intent was there. But the other important thing is that, that uh, Galliat and Company supplied uh, the Ordnance Bureau, run by Major Caleb Hughes, with machinery or, or, or financed the purchase of machinery in, in, um, the, in, in Britain. And also George, uh, Colonel George W. Rains, who operated the powder works in Augusta, Georgia. Major John Mallett, superintendent of the Ordnance Laboratories in Richmond, and uh, Superintendent James H. Burton, who was, a, who was a superintendent of the Richmond Armoury. Uh, uh, um, Harry Galliat was in touch with all of these people and, uh, and uh, financing and uh, purchasing. And if he wasn't uh, shipping um, this, uh, th this material over in his own blockade runners, he was surely shipping it over in somebody else's. Uh, and lastly, on this count, uh, uh, the Virginia Military Academy has um, connections with the Gallia um, uh, Company. J.K. Gallia um, is one of the scholarships. The, the J.K. Gallia Scholarship was set up and remains to this day um, part of, of that academy. So this this purchase with the, the sheet music and the images was, was, was quite a fine. Um, of course, I was baffled at what, what were they doing um, in Cheltenham, actually, over here in Gloucestershire. And it turns out the signature on this sheet music and the other side is Percy Galliat. And Percy Galliat was the younger brother of Harry Galliat. And uh, per Percy, uh, whether he had much to do with uh, running of the firm or not, I'm not sure, but, but, but. He retired in Cheltenham, which is about um, about 10 miles away from where I am. And um, somehow or another, this student's mother or family acquired this little archive and um, sold it to me. So that's how I came across my first images. Okay, it's taken up quarter of an hour. Okay, right. Um, questions. Um, any special memories about my early days of collecting? Well, that's a pretty special memory. Uh, but 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 one of the questions uh, referred to mentors, and uh, and one of my biggest uh, um, mentors was um, Michael J. McAfee. 
I was in touch with Mike from from the mid 80s, 1980s, uh, with letters and inquiries for research for the work I was doing for the Company of Military Historians and Confederate Star Society, and he was amazingly helpful. He would uh, um, scan, not scan in those days, but photograph and, uh, and, and send me copies of images by request. Sometimes he volunteered the information because he thought it might help me. And so through the years, he, the relationship developed and I was in touch with him on a regular basis. And I have to say, um, um, it, during the last couple of years before he passed, um, sometimes it was almost on a daily basis that, that um, I shared information with him and he shared information with me. And a lot of that led to uh, the publication of uh, one of my uh, books, um, Rally Around the Flag. Um, okay, so that's, I'll mention Mike as we go as well. Um, um, favorite photograph of all time. Well, I'll start shuffling through now and see what we can get quickly out of the way. Okay. Favorite photograph of all time has got to be this one. I acquired that from some, uh, a, a seller in Somerville, Somerville, South Carolina, and it's a blue ninth plate ambrotype of a young Confederate volunteer. And uh, that's the image I use for um, the front cover of Start the Witness. There it is. Uh, with this, with this um, view, I, I, I emphasise the blueness of the uh, blue glass amber type because I really wanted that to to register, as it were, and have an impact. But they are very rare. Uh, I, I've, I've not seen many others. But every time I mention that, somebody will pop up with one and say, "Yeah, I've got one here," and, and so maybe they're not as rare as I, I, I thought they were. But I'm really, I'm really proud of that image. Um, and uh, it's it's my most favourite image. Okay, um, yeah, I'll move on again through because um, I want to talk about books. Uh, okay, one hand. This is it. One image I, I showed on Facebook a little while back. It's one of the images that I wish had been in um, Silent Witness because it's a wonderful view of a period photographer. And I love the way he's balanced his hat on top of the camera. And it's beautifully tinted, colored image. And uh, I still haven't fa managed to find out anything about Feist, J Jerome Feist, whatever, still looking. But that's a favourite image, and I also, and I, I wish I had that image when I published the um, Silent Witness. Just before I move off Silent Witness, this is another. I, I showcased this image in Silent Witness because I was really very struck by this. That's a, a, a black hussar. Uh, one of my passions is collecting uh, um, antebellum pre-Civil War militia images. This is one of uh, the ones I'm really pleased with. There were Black Hussar units in um, Philadelphia, Chicago, San Francisco. I don't know where this one originated. I wish I knew. Maybe one day I'll find out. Um, it's this. This is a. Um, come on, zip on. Like an amber, amber type. No, I can't. Oh, magenta, uh, magenta, uh, six plate amber type. Uh, and I acquired this from um, Rick Brown back in, <laughs> whether you can remember, uh, 2008. Another delight that I showcased in. Um, 
Silent Witness is this guy. I love the red coat. Again, I'd love to know the actual unit. There are a number of uh, militia uh, um, units, in, uh, particularly in the south, but I guess in the north as well. The Abbeville Volunteers of South Carolina comes to mind. And I, I, there's, there's, there's a cockade there, whether that's uh, secession or whether it's a union cockade, whether it's north or south. I don't know. One of these days, maybe I'll find out. But again, another treasure. Okay. Um, moving on to other books. And um, first off, running around the flag. This one. One of the images in this was wrongly captioned. It was that one. Uh, one of the gremlins crept into the, this part of the production line and uh, it was uh, wrongly uh, captioned as the Boston Light Artillery. In actual fact, so I can tell everybody now, John Fish. Sergeant John Fish, and this is well, it's that a quarter plate albumen, and he's wearing the grey chasseur uniform, which was supplied to the Seventh Massachusetts Volunteers in uh, uh, the spring of 1861. Um, John Fish um, served through the um, Peninsula Campaign, and and then. For some reason he was reduced to the ranks um, in June, July of 1862, and I don't know why, but he got sick as well. Uh, and then his medical record indicates that he was sick before he actually volunteered. He had a scrofula, a form of TB, and I guess it got the better of him. And uh, so he, uh, I think he was honorably discharged though, and he would have deserved that. Um, and then he later volunteered. Um, to serve on the, in the Long Point Battery, on the right on the tip of uh, of Cape Cod, uh, and he served there from uh, 1864 through to the end of the war, or close to anyway. So I'll put the record straight about John Fish now. And and, and this 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 is one image that I I recently acquired from the uh, uh, the Michael J McAfee estate, and I was really pleased to obtain it because because um, of my relationship with, with Mike and association with him and so on. And it's so nice to have some of his images now. That's one of them. Thank you. Um, other images in... Um, so I, I'm passing... What I'm doing is I'm passing my, my, my catalogue pages. This is the wrong field collection. And it's got information... Uh, to hand to remind me and when they were purchased and so on and so forth and so it's just a prompt for me um, so we'll we'll go to these guys New Hampshire man coming the right way and up and over these two guys are either first or second New Hampshire and what fascinated me about this image is they are wearing the um, first issue grey uniform with the tails, with the, the spiked tailed coat. And it was Mike McAfee who, when I showed him this image, he pointed out that this is a remarkably casual image for 1861. These two, well, they're just buddies or brothers or what. But the guy on the um, left appears to be turning, almost as if to say, Look at my coattails. And it's the only image that I've um, seen um, in other collections that, that actually really does show the coattails of, of this uniform. Otherwise, it's just a, a given that that's what it was based on research. And so, on. so that's the two New Hampshire guys. Oh, and when, when, when I acquired that image, um, it, it was behind a patriotic uh, mat, and when I lifted the mat, there was another mat, which was probably the original one. 
and uh, this image is still sealed it's still in its original seals i'm just done um yeah uh new hampshire this i haven't published but it's one i'm pleased with it's third new hampshire wearing the gray doe skin uh, uniform which was um produced by lincoln and shaw lincoln and shaw were the clothiers who, who produced uniform clothing for um half a dozen of the of the early number new hampshire uh, regiments and he's got the puritan and ham uh, havelock cap on there too which everybody for years was baffled about what is that on their head um, and he's got a uh, a pocket colt revolver and a spear pointed uh, knife tucked in his belt and a lee uh, and a um, sorry and, a, and a, an enfield rifled musket Nice image. Again from Rally Around the Flag. This is Ira Wynn. Ira Wynn is the only man in the, uh, the first Maine to die in the three months service. And he got typhoid fever in uh, Washington DC during the tour of duty there. And he was sent home in the sick wagon and uh, died a few days later um, obviously this is a uh, um, a later uh, um, um, cdv uh, reproduction of an earlier hard case image um, i'd love to know where the original is the, uh, the, the hard case image but there we are at least we've got that record of um Irwin. the emperor rally around the flag we'll keep up with it my prompts then yep yep this is um in rally around the flag um in massachusetts the beverly light infantry probably it, it was produced in beverly mass anyway and um an unusual um cap dress cap of European influence rather than of American influence, possibly of French influence, that was not is not often seen, um, which attracted me to it. Um, you never know what you're going to find when you take the the mats off, if you can, you know, safely. When I did with this one, a beautiful make that out a beautiful belt plate. Um, early militia belt plate i think it's an eagle one so nothing to say which company sometimes they have the name of the company print um embossed on them so and uh and a beautiful uh, photographer's uh, card in back there one of one of the one of the nicest ones that i've seen actually with all of the um a panoply of uh, photographers uh, equipment there uh, and I know that I bit, I bit against Mike McAfee this image, uh, and uh, he uh, he was very gracious about it. I knew he was interested in it, um, but I, I knew he would be. I'd be interested in it too. In a lovely little case, the whole the whole deal is it was a beautiful acquisition. Mike was happy about it for me. Um, Confederates, then. Um, this one was produced in Confederate Faces, William Orbar's uh, Confederate Faces in 1970. So it comes out of that. And uh, it's, we believe, Second South Carolina, taken in Columbia. And if you can make out, unfortunately, the, the, the background color is the same color as his uniform. So the, the photographer wasn't thinking really much about that. But if you can make out the palmetto, which is uh, gold painted on the top of it on on the front of his uh, his cap um, and the possibility is this guy is um, Joseph Wilcott McPherson but I don't know for sure but that's the closest name we've got 
that. Uh, another confederate. This I had published in um, one of my Osprey books on the Confederate Army. And uh, this came out of Arkansas. And he's holding what one must imagine is an Arkansas toothpick, um, quite a li large knife, and a um, pocket colt. And I was told by a colt expert that the type of colt, oh, this, the type of colt he has is a baby, a dragoon. Um, and only me, only a few hundred. No, I can't see the actual information ever. Only a few hundred of these uh, of the cults of the type of dragoon cult that baby dragoon cult that um, this man is holding were ever produced. So he he was quite um, fascinated by the fact that that that's that's um, that's the. Uh, revolver he was holding with a confederate it's tom mcculloch 154 tennessee i believe trouble is there are there are half a dozen tom mcculloch's um and there's a message inside the case written inside um the case to um lizzie mccoy or something like that um i've not managed to establish sure that this is Thomas McCulloch but well you know you get a feel for images and that looks to me like um, South that looks to me like could be a secession cockade the the wheel hats interesting and the shirts very unusual so the possibility remains but it's yet to be proven um, Thing about cases by the way um i do like cases one of the things that mike said to me was once when i started talking about cases <clears throat> i said i really like this case that went with this image came with this image and he said or he, he, he emailed back don't become a case collector um and that brought me up short but i'm afraid i have to some extent and my policy with cases is is if if the case bears history which strongly associates it with the image uh, especially if it's signed then you keep the two together if i get an image which is falling in a falling apart case half a case sometimes even less than that i don't see any point in trying to keep contain that image it's not being looked after properly so I keep the original image uh, as uh, in, uh, I know where it is um, and I look for um, nicer cases for it to go in cases that you know in some cases <laughs> would, would look as they were when they're in their original state particularly with the gilt on and so on and the nice pads um, that's just my thing I, I know a lot of case collect uh, of uh, image collectors would say would frown on that and say that's not right but that's what I do. Um, as long as I keep the original case falling apart case, it still means uh, I've got a record of it. And if ever I wanted to combine the two back together again, I can. Um, one last confederate. I'm losing track here. Yeah. Oars rifles. Difficult to show you properly, but the trim on the uniform is has been tinted green you can see it on the trouser seam stripes if you look very closely i don't know how much you guys can see really but uh, the green trim is is it really picks out the um oars rifles regiment of like, first south carolina regiment of rifles right uh, james oars uh, regiment and it came out of Anderson County, South Carolina, um, and that that for me is is a dead ringer for a no name but a, oars rifles. Okay, um, 
Oh right, yeah, I'll, I'll, I will show you this actually. I wasn't going to talk about this one, but this is um, again South Carolina. I I think I'm fairly certain this is um, Highland Guard, South Carolina militia, has uh, Lady of Liberty on his breastplate and uh, on the uh, Sporran. Um, uh, the, the, I forget the, the, the furniture at the top of the, the, the Sporran. Uh, there's indications of palmettos. This is the Highland Guard who were um, um, active, uh, I think it was until about 1858 or 59, um, before the membership faded to such an extent that they were no longer active. But many of them then went on to serve in other units. So there's a Highlander in full dress there. And for all intents and purposes, that's a Confederate. Um, <clears throat> The connection to the Navy, time. Um, I've for some years had a great interest in the uh, New York, first New York Marine Artillery, and um, raised by Colonel William A. Howard in 1861-62, um, I acquired this, which is a horse marine. For all intents and purposes, that was their nickname. He's got riding boots on. He's got a sailor's cap, sailor's round jacket, done up. And uh, this is Andrew Wentz, who uh, lived in Chicago, and he enlisted in the um, co which company was it? Company G of the First New York Marine Artillery. Um, and uh, what came with it was Andrew went in his civilian attire, a nicely tinted image. Andrew went in the um, census, if it's the same guy, and I, I've no reason to believe it's not, in Chicago, was a daguerreotype case maker. And so that was a double hit for me when I got those two. And then that led me on to ask, um, particularly um, Mike, uh, to help with the uh, New York Marine Artillery, and I managed to put an article together which is being published by Civil War Navy magazine um, at some point in the not too distant future. And uh, so I managed to acquire this is, this is um, Alexander Carthel, he is also, there we go, first New York Marine Artillery, sailor's cap, um, work shirt. And uh, button fly trousers. They didn't wear forefront trousers. Um, and um, Castle was Company D, First Marine, uh, New York Marine Artillery. Um, they served on the North Carolina coast, on the inlets and the rivers. Um, they were literally regarded as horse marines. They were mounted sometimes. They they pulled cannon ashore and were, were um, a very very active. But these two guys were in um, garrison at Newburn for most of the uh, most of that time. And uh, lastly, an officer, Company A. And this is uh, no, I passed him over. This is uh, Sylvester D. Nicole, and and the thing about the uniform chosen by Colonel Howard for his regiment. It was a mixture of Navy and Army um, and the cap plate on the officers uh, caps was a crossed cannon and anchor. Uh, you, you know, with, 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 with a loop, you could really make that out, but it's difficult to see that on this image, but it will be published in the article on the service of these guys. Um, I've got, I have several other New York Marine artillery um, in the collection, but um to move on uh, to the navy uh, and, and one of the one of the points that um questions was about what on earth am i doing with all this navy stuff you got blue jackets going on there since 2010 um why no particular reason other than i looked around and i couldn't see um a book that was fully illustrated um, about the Navy, you know, with with images that 
you could um, study and compare and uh, collect and so on and so forth. So I went for it and uh, Schiffer were interested. And so Schiffer published the book. And uh, so some of the images that appeared in um, this, this was a real learning curve for me and so, well, any, any project is really, but it was a learning curve in the sense that I acquired images for the book and I'm very pleased to do so. And this was one of the first images that I acquired to get because I knew this was a master, um, um, a um, officer, um, a, a, a sea officer in full dress. And it was unidentified and had no idea, but it was just an example I, I used in the book. Um, and lo and behold, This image popped up on eBay, and the seller, who was selling a lot of Navy officers' images, um, advertised it or, or, or um, described it as uh, um, William Brady, who was the master of the yard of New York, the New York Navy Yard. And that's clearly the same guy. Same guy, same probably the same studio session, same photographer, which was uh, William Hunter. Um, and so the kind of learning curve I was on, he was realizing that you can publish images, you can use them for one purpose, and then suddenly they, they, they find you again and they come around and they say, this is who I am. Same with this guy. Edward Sheffield, Navy Lieutenant. I published him in uh, Blue Jackets as unidentified, but an example of, of that rank. Wait. Uh, un, 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 sorry, unidentified master, he wasn't a lieutenant. Again. Um, and then, lo and behold, on eBay, an album, which I could not, I could not believe. I, I contacted the seller and said, are you sure? And he said, yeah, I'm sure that that's what we have here. And so I don't know whether you'll be able to make this out. There's awkward things to deal with. There he is. There we go. It's the same image. It's just from the exactly the same session, you know, this is one of the 12 or whatever that was produced on that plate. And um, opposite is the, his gunboat, USS Winnebago. No, sorry, Winona. In the album. And if that wasn't good enough, turn the page over. And there he is again. Got that or not? Can't see. The album's in the way. Now, what I'll do is I'll show you the um, copy of that because something intriguing on it. Oh, I won't do that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Capture, take it out of the sleeve. A lot of writing, interesting stuff on the the album page for Edward Sheffield. And what it says at one point is these are sorry, uh, that their son was Edward Sheffield, who owned the sword. Now I wonder where Edward Sheffield's sword is now. A family member had it. Hopefully they've still got it. Maybe one day they'll um, catch up with me with that with this album. It baffles me really. Not they go astray like this, but still. Um, one other image in the same album, which I had no idea until I started looking into this guy. 
I, I posted him on my Facebook page, on, on various Facebook pages. Um, and this is, I remember his name actually, Zebulon Hancocks, local eccentric of Stonington, Connecticut. And uh, Zebulon, uh, amazing story. I had, I had more hits on this image than any other one I've posted, that's in the mission, on, on Facebook. Zebulon Hancocks was fascinating people because because he was su such a forlorn looking individual you can see his his raggedy coat and um he, he used to uh, uh, he, his heart was broken he was jilted and 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 uh, so he he had he just changed his whole attitude towards life became very independent very solitary but absolutely determined to become very wealthy and so he made everything he made his own clothes you wouldn't think so from what he's wearing he, he wove baskets and sold them uh, on the seafront and it, eventually he was so wealthy he, he, he owned a good deal of Stonington. When I was over there in 2010 um, after coming down from uh, Providence from the fellowship at Brown University I, I, I had a nose around Stonington and uh, I don't know I just wanted to feel get the feel of the place and it's a lovely coastal area mystic down there is beautiful as well but i you know i just wanted to reach out to somebody and say i've, I've got images um of some of your people but i, I never really had an opportunity because we were moving on traveling to actually contact anybody and, and and to say um does anybody know these people um edward sheffield um zebulon hancocks um, but the album's here anyway. Um, there he is again. That's a better. Debbie. Um, this is the story of what can happen with albums. Nice album. I got it eventually. But this is what can happen. Scissors. Cut the sailor out. Never mind about the album. And put the sailor on. Auction. This is Albert Angel, which I was pleased to acquire. Albert Angel served on the Catskill, one of the monitors off Charleston, South Carolina. He was a gun gunsmith in New York. He got ill on the monitor and uh, had to come home. In later life, he became a very successful journalist, newspaper um, editor in New York City. Um, I've still got a work to do, really, to find out more about uh, Albert Angel. Um, his family on his wife's side came down from Nova Scotia. And, uh, well, looking at the rest of the album, Albums are an abs absolute treasure trove. This guy, James, James Angel of Galveston, Texas, obviously a relative. I think it's an uncle. He, he, he was out there in Galveston throughout the Civil War. And he was a doctor of homeopathy. And... Uh, I'm only just really getting around to finding out about James Angel uh, and, and, and what, he, what he did. Uncle James Angel, Galveston, Texas. On the opposite facing page, this, sorry, this lady is his wife. Amazing looking lady. I wish I could get my angles right here, sorry. Everything is opposite to what you want to do. She was his wife and it and written on the page is Aunt Lucy, Uncle James swam with her and their eldest son under his arm and they were rescued when the ship went down on the way from England. I, I find that's just, that, and, and on the last page, they're talking about the fact that the family is related to retainers of uh, King Henry VII in 1485 in, in England. So 
I mean, it's, it's an absolute treasure trove, and you shouldn't really go cutting pages out of them now, should you? Anyway. Um, I'm doing for time. Ten minutes left. Okay. Um, this is a recent acquisition, Navy. Beautiful case. And this is the uh, Roger de Coverley case, which um, actually no, I won't show you that right now. I just I've missed the whole load out. Um, let me show you this one next. This is better. Do it this way around. This is Clinton Gardner. There we go. Clinton Gardner. Established it was him. There's an inscription on the back, on the reverse, to his cousin, Ellen Gardner, from Clinton, US Navy, uh, taken at Paducah. So there are only a couple of um, only a couple of photographers in uh, Paducah to, to narrow it down. Uh, um, Clinton Gardner, if I just find him here. I'm going to miss about way too much material. Here. Um, Clinton Gardner served on the gunboat Paw Paw on the Mississippi and Great Rivers. Um, and um, poor fellow. Uh, within the first few weeks of his service, he was detailed to clean out a boiler. And apparently there was a, heavy lot of, a lot of heavy shoveling and so on to do. And he ruptured himself. He um, sustained a hernia. And that put him on the, the sick list for the rest of his term. But he served it and he was a ship's cook. He was a, a cook on the, uh, the gunboat Paw Paw. Now, I was pleased to get him. I love them when they've got inscriptions on. But then, lo and behold, this fella comes along, which is the image in the Roger de Coverley case, which is a nice thing, nice hard case. Sorry. <laughs> this fella comes along, and it's a monitor case. And you think, well, you know, that that's... The case is nice, but the, the double um, hit for this one was the fact it had a navy image inside. There we go. And I, I, I thought I'm really going to go after this image because it's nice with the case. Uh, uh, I've always wanted a monitor case but with a navy image in. That, that's that's really good. And so I, I, I acquired the image. And, you know, you, you really want to scrutinise, uh, of course, you want to have a close-up inspection and so on. And it suddenly hit me, this is Clinton Gardner. It's him again. Uh, and I, was, I, I really was at pains to make sure that I was doing this right. And uh, so I did a Photoshop job on this. Now, I, I merged the two together and flipped the one so they were both facing the, so, so that the, uh, the uh, hard plate image, the, the, the tin type, was facing the same way as the albumin. And, uh, well, there he is. That is, is the same guy. And that is just amazing. That, this is what fascinates me about collecting, is that these things, they almost they define one another, you know. We are just kind of, we're caretakers of them. And, and, and they seek us out. And uh, um, so they're back together. Clinton Gardner, two, two obviously, um, whether he had any more taken or not. This, 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 this guy, another sailor. This is Byron Drown, a very apt name for a sailor. That's all three of, the, of those guys is Byron Drown. He was a boy, second class, Byron Drown. Son of a shoemaker from Plattsburgh, in New York State. Wanted to join the army 
ran away and one of these one of these guys he was grabbed back by his parents and they said well no but you can go in the navy and so they they let him go in the navy boy second class and uh, he um he got on very well actually but I, I like to consider this guy as the milo minder of the navy uh, from from uh, catch 22 if you remember um he was an entrepreneur um he 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 realized that the navy couldn't produce decent shoes what did his father do he was a shoemaker and so he arranged for boxes of shoes to be shipped on um on on the um the, the, the service uh, vessels out to the blockade fleet he was on the uh, blockade of the uss midnight the sailing bark and he sold them on to his um his shipmates sold the shoes one of the things i love is when one acquires a letter which is associated with an image this is written by byron drown to his father um, and it's about the shoes, supplying the shoes. He's, he's ordering shoes. Um, just to read out the last paragraph, if I may, because I find just so apt at what they say. I hope the Republicans will run old Abe again. So he's a Republican here. Did you see that editorial in the New York Herald about Bunsey Wells. Now I assume this is this is a nickname for Gideon Wells, Navy Secretary, the boat jockey. It hits pretty hard on matters about his show. Sorry, his slow two dog power steamers. I must close. So goodbye. And so that's a letter from 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 Byron Drown. Now, the thing about Byron is. Byron doesn't just stop doing what he's doing at the end of the, of course, he leaves the Navy at the end of the war. Byron eventually gets off out to El Paso in Texas. That's him a little bit later in the war, by the way. You wouldn't think so, but he's obviously lost weight. And this is Byron later on in uh, life in the, um, as a veteran. Um, sorry. Right. Um, he eventually represented the Navy um, in the in the Veterans Association and uh, went to Washington, D.C. in um, just get the year. 19. Oh, no, not 1907. 1902. Anyway, in about there. And um, he gathers at Washington with his uh, his uh, um, fellow shipmates, um, but he turns up there with with um, with uh, Mexican money, Mexican script, which he uh, acquired during his service along the Mexican border. He had his name printed on it, on, on this money, and he was giving it out uh, in lieu of visiting cards, which I've never heard of anybody doing that before. Um, and he said, basically, his comment was, "Everybody thinks I'm a millionaire because I'm giving money away." But what he did in 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 Texas is he was a Wells Fargo guard. He, he rode shotgun on uh, the uh, the steam trains carrying gold bullion and so on and so forth. And uh, there's an amazing description of him. If I can find it, um, there are very few. There are very few expressmen in the great southwest who cannot claim a personal acquaintance with the veteran guard captain drown for the past 18 years captain drown has served as messenger and guard on different railroad lines running in and out of texas and is a well-known express figure he is familiarly known as a man of strong physique keen intelligence and a kind heart he is a justly popular member of our express family partly because of his willingness and desire to help younger and less experienced ex expressed men. Should you happen to see him on his run in the capacity of guard, you will find him armed with a 38 automatic Colt 
and the familiar sword off shotgun, keeping a watchful eye on shipments entrusted to him. Byron Drown, what an amazing character. And uh, there's an article about Byron, which will be published in the Civil War Navy magazine in the not too distant future. So, right away. Coming to the end, folks. Coming to the end, yeah, need to finish off. Um, I'll finish off with two images. This one. Here we are. This is this is Roger de Coverley, hard case. And inside, beautiful navy image. This is one of those get this right. One of those images. There's a whole collection of these. Back in the same studio. Still haven't managed to work out where it is, but I've got a feeling it's it's uh, at um, Hampton Roads, Fortress Monroe, uh, with a ship, sh uh, uh, ship scene in the background, um, Stars and Stripes flag over the um, high table, and the guy's got his hand on his hip. And in, in back there was a, an address, in that fact for what turned out to be his wife. This is Peter Dupre, came down from Canada to enlist in the Navy and uh, served for one year. Um, and saw some service um, in the blockade and so on. Now the thing is, always keep an eye open in case you've seen your image somewhere else. And I don't know whether people know what I'm leading up to here. If you know your Navy images, well, this is what I'm saying. That the image on the this one, right, that one, is Peter Dupre, but it's in the Library of Congress, unidentified. My image is Peter Dupre, is it identified based on his wife's address in back of the image. So there we have, uh, um, I've not shared this with many people yet, so kind of a first gary mccrory knows um about this one and he's publishing a um a short piece in the navy naval archive column about identifying a, a navy image and how one can do this with a great deal of luck lastly if this works thinking ahead of for the future uh, and my third book on uniforms of 1861 Coming closer now. This is Indiana, and this is five young volunteers of the 9th Indiana in their second uniform uh, after their sheep's grey wool. The uniform had fallen apart in their first three months' service. They received this New York uh, style uniform uh, and they pose very proudly in it. Um, and this is a half plate ambrotype one of the largest images I've got in my collection. Well, I've better finish now, three minutes over time. Um, I've enjoyed this. It's been a fascinating experience to share uh, my, my collection because uh, I don't get much opportunity to do that over here. Um, I think I'm virtually not the only one. Um, so I, I thank you one and all for listening to me this evening and and uh, letting me letting me uh, run some stories by you. Um, every image has a story, whether it's just about the uniform or whether it's about the individual identified or waiting to be identified in the image. Um, everyone has a story and it's either waiting to be told or will almost tell itself. So. That's it, basically. I, I guess I'd better sign off now. And uh, I thank you again um, for, uh, for listening and, and watching. Thanks, folks, and bye.